Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Monday, March 19th uh, meeting of the Evanston City Council. Uh, we have a quorum. Uh, our mayor, uh, Steve Haggerty, is out of town right now, so I am uh, serving as mayor pro tem right now. Uh, so first, city clerk, would you call the roll? Alderman Rainey? Here. Alderman Fleming? Here. Alderman Fisk? Here. Alderman Braithwaite? Alderman Nguyen? Here. Al Alderman Wilson? Alderman Ruth Simmons? Here. Alderman Sufferden? Here. Alderman Ravel? Here. Thank you. Uh, we have a quorum. Alderman Braithwaite will be coming in shortly. Uh, and under Mayor's public announcements and proclamations, this is National Public Health Week, April, well, I'm announcing uh, National Public Health Week, which is coming up April 2nd through the 6th. Uh, and this is our last city council meeting before then. And I'd like to read a little bit. Uh, during the first full week of April each year, uh, the American Public Health Association brings together communities across the United States to observe National Public Health Week as a time to recognize the contributions of public health and highlight issues that are important to improving our nation's health. For over 20 years, the American uh, Society of Public Health Associates has served as the organizer of the N National Public Health Week. Every year, the association develops a national campaign to educate the public, policymakers, and practitioners about issues related to each year's theme. Since the Affordable Care Act became law, the United States' uninsured rate has dropped to record lows, but continued targeted attempts to dismantle the law include the recent repeal of individual mandate. Our social safety net programs are being threatened with cuts, and for the second year in a row, life expectancy in the United States has dropped. To ensure everyone has a chance at a long and healthy life, we must also tackle the underlying issues, underlying causes of poor health and disease risk. Those causes are rooted in how and where we live, learn, work, and play. It's the child who goes to school hungry and can't take full advantage of the education that leads to a healthier, more productive adulthood. It's the low-wage worker who must choose between losing much-needed income and staying home with a sick child. It's the family that struggles to find nutritious, affordable food anywhere in their community. It's the student who can't walk to school because there are no sidewalks. These are the types of conditions that shape the health and well-being of our people and communities. Thankfully, we can do something if we partner across public and private sectors to ensure decisions are made with people's health in mind. We can build healthier communities and eventually the healthiest nation. We can change our future together, but we need your help to get there. Join us in observing National Public Health Week 2018 and become part of a growing movement to create the healthiest nation in one generation. We'll celebrate the power of prevention, advocate for healthy and fair policies, share strategies for successful partnerships, and champion the role of a strong public health system. That is coming up April 2nd through 6th, 2018. Okay, next is city manager public announcements. City manager, do you have any announcements? Madam Mayor, for I do not. All right. So uh, tonight we have, uh, this is a, uh, not our no. usual city council meeting, so we have a number of communications. City Clerk, do you have communications? Yes. Uh, the only communication I have is that uh, tomorrow is election day uh, for the gubernatorial primary. Uh, polling, we have uh, several polling locations throughout the city. You'll be able to find that full list on the city's website. Uh, also, I want to announce that uh, Evanston, uh, for the first time, uh, took the top spot in utilization of our early voting uh, site. We had over 6,000 folks early vote here, which uh, is the highest we've ever had in a, uh, a primary. We also, but we also took the top spot for a suburban Cook County in utilization of our early voting center. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. This place was busy this week. Yeah. yeah. All we right. Almost 1,000 people vote today. Yeah. Just today. Just today. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next item we have is public comment. Uh, the first item I have on the list is uh, James Engelman. Good evening. My name is James Engelman. I'm from the Fifth Ward. My um, my discussion is um, I was at the war meeting and the the guy was talking about a marshmallow drop, and he was saying that the marshmallows won't be able to um, be able to eat. Now, 
and he's got, and he was talking about a helicopter, which and it would cost a thousand dollars. Now that's a little bit too much, but I was thinking if a per, if um, if the marshmallows fell on the ground and they're not able to eat, and say like a family has three girls, three kids, and you can and, and there's one parent, how can a person watch all three kids? Um, pick up a marshmallow because one of them might eat it, you know, and get sick. Or a dog, you know what I mean? A dog, um, and if, I just don't want the city to be sued, you know what I mean? Um, I care about these kids, and I, you know, I care about the city. And I think the uh, the money should be worth. Uh, 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 spent more uh, um, butter because I think you guys should have raises. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. All right. okay. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, maybe a few words about the marshmallow drop. Uh, first of all, uh, the marshmallows will be edible, but we will be offering the participants something better, and that's prizes. So the, the marshmallows will be covered in cornstarch um, so that they do not stick together. So we're hoping that the cornstarch will uh, be a deterrent for perhaps those younger participants. If, if it is not, um, we, we don't anticipate there being any problem. But again, if, if a marshmallow is eaten, they won't be able to get prizes. So we hope that that is uh, incentive enough uh, to do that. Uh, we're very excited about doing this. Uh, you know, certainly special events more and more people are looking uh, for with their families, and we're very excited uh, about this with the marshmallow. Uh, drop. We've had lots of questions from the community about this. We're going to put a frequently asked questions list on our website here in the next day or so uh, to answer other questions. But uh, again, I really commend our staff for sort of thinking outside the box as a way to, you know, bring people together in the community. We hope this will be a fun, fun event. Thank you, City Manager. Uh, that is, a, there's a very famous psychological study about delayed, um, whether you can delay eating a marshmallow or not. Um, so. Uh, I won't tell you what it's about. All right, uh, Junad Ritsky. Oh God. And then after Junad will be Virginia Beatty, and then Michael Donoroff. Just as before I start, I thought it was interesting. You mentioned no sidewalks for children. I thought in the eighth ward, I heard there were no, some sidewalks missing, but we've got money for a dinner theater. But that's that's where I'm going to move with my topic. Once again, I ask that the city manager be removed. Um, it seems like he cannot reform his fiscal responsibilities, and senior council members have created this budget crisis. At the last meeting, I noticed we changed how the financial operations of the city are going to be work, worked in a poorly worded document with mistakes in the language was stuck in there. I didn't, don't know if any council members even discussed this, but now we appear to have hired a middle-level employee to take over the position of Mr. Lines in this position, and, and we did this, this what I would call manipulation, and we're in, a, we're in a major financial crisis here, and this is how we're operating the city. So it, it causes me great concern. Why didn't we find a senior level, high quality person to come in here to run this department? And, you know, I've been suggesting the city is bankrupt. Now, by bankruptcy, I mean not that we're going to close the place down. It's going to be huge tax increases. And the aldermen all sit here and, and think it's not going to happen. Well, it is going to happen. 100% is a very likely number, but it will be over <laughs> several years because things are so serious here. Um, and I believe covered up. Um, the presentation on water revenues, in, in my opinion, was a lot of a very much another farce. I, I've been talking about this now for quite a few years. Basically, the money's been colluded between the capital, the other capital here in the budget, and you don't know how the operation works. And he, Mr. Stonebeck couldn't present that to you. He didn't even include the Evanston ratepayers in the whole thing. And that's, that's a big problem to me, and, and you're not really going to deal with it. These people need to be held accountable, and they need to deal with this. A proper financial person needs to come in here and run that water department that can do the work. It does not appear to be happening. And, and frankly, the mayor made a comment I thought was interesting because he usually doesn't seem to have any fiscal leadership either. He was concerned about the reservoir project at one point. That's probably destroyed the capital here at $20 million. And it was an unnecessary project, by the way. And I've, I basically told you that at quite a few meetings. And then on Robert Crown, I, to suggest that this will be finished in 18 months, 
with the condition of those drawings, it's not even started. It will not be done. And the, the assistant city manager, I think somebody said here she's running it day to day. She made the comment, you know, if everything works perfectly, it will be done. Well, it's not going to be done in 18 months. I suggest she's another person that should probably be looking for employment elsewhere because it's not going to happen. It's time to hold people accountable here for everything they do. And that's really what has to happen. And I'm, I think as, as a citizen, I don't mind paying 100 percent in property taxes if we clean up the mess here. But are we going to clean it up? I don't think we are because we've got to clean it up and we've got to basically bring in some new leadership here to deal with it. And you will all be held accountable, too, because when this hundred this, this money keeps coming and the, and the problems keep coming, people are going to figure it out and they're going to figure out what's wrong. And it's pretty serious. We don't have the money to run the operations. A lot of employees were let go last year, and it's more to come because everything's been misused. The money has been misused here on too many pet projects and too many things that shouldn't have been misused on. The biggest thing, and I think it was in the roundtable by Mr. Jones, um, the basically, Sean, that, that you basically are not asking the questions. You have a responsibility to, every time these people present something to demand what they're saying, you to question it and to ask questions. And if it's not done right, send it back and deal with it. And don't allow Mr. Bobkowitz to put down defective work every, at every meeting. It's not acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Virginia Beatty. Yes. Good evening. My name is Virginia Beatty and I'm 1509 Forest Avenue in Evanston. And I'd like to state that I'm an Evanstonian by choice. I came here in 1963. My husband was a new professor at Northwestern and we had three children. Margaret, our oldest, was in uh, Miller School, first grade. And the other two were going around town with me uh, trying to learn a little more about Evanston. Evanston was a very special place at that time. It had nine wards, but it had 18 aldermen. It was a great university town, had an interesting history, and was just filled with fascinating people. Especially welcoming to me were the University Circle and the League of Women Voters. The League helped me to find out more about Evanston, and I was co-editor of the 1964 This is Evanston picture the covers out on the front. On February 12th this year, I respectfully suggested that with the centennial celebrations for the passage of the 18th and 19th Amendment that Elvinson celebrate further by creating a woman's park. And uh, the area would be, I'd suggest, in front of Northwestern so that we could exchange uh, ideas and positions clearly. It could be designed to uh, bring people together. And uh, if we used uh, pavers with names and dates on it, we could uh, kind of uh, compliment or remember uh, some of Evanson's uh, former residents. And um, people could learn the names and dates of uh, some of the people that made a difference. I uh, would like you also to take a note of the picture on the back uh, that's current Evanston, Illinois um, offering on the internet. And I think Evanson's much more exciting than that. And if you would like, let's put a woman's park in there and show them what Evansonians can do. I don't mind helping men work things out, but I really would like to see more uh, for us who are here and who believe in Evanson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Beatty. Next is uh, Michael, is it Donoroff? Hi, my name is Michael Donoroff. I'm a resident of the Fifth Ward. I'm here on behalf of Northwestern Student Government. I just wanted to take a moment to thank the Evanston Police Department for their rapid response last year in court, uh, last week, and coordination um, with the Northwestern Police Department in the swatting incident last year. And fortunately, it was just that, a swatting incident, and no one was, no one was hurt. Um, but it was, students were very shaken nonetheless. Um, I was stranded in a room, in a small room, 
on the north of campus for about two hours. And I know that a lot of my housemates and friends were stranded in Norris, stuck there, huddled, just wondering if Northwestern was next. Um, and earlier in the day, uh, there was a walkout, uh, as well as at ETHS and other schools around the city and the country. Um, to say enough is enough. And I know most of the power lies with the state and federal government on this issue, but I just urge city council and everyone here to whatever, at whatever capacity they have to talk to their representatives and whatever connections they have in the state or federal government to say enough is enough and to take action on gun control. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our citizen comment. So uh, the public comment section. So next we will proceed with our special orders of business. Madam Mayor, part time members of the council, I, I think given uh, the agenda this evening, uh, perhaps it might make sense to do the consent calendar okay. from administration and public works. I think there are a number of folks that are here for that, those items. Uh, and if that could be yes. dispensed okay. with them, we can go back. All right. Okay. We can do that. Alderman Rainey, would you like to take us through consent? I, I would. Just let me, I wasn't quite prepared. Just give me one second. Pour it all up. And Alderman Rainey, we're passing out revised versions of A2 30, Ordinance 33018 uh, to reflect the discussion of the committee. So if you could pull that from the consent calendar for us to introduce or to explain, we appreciate it. Just give me a minute here to ask you. Alderman Rainey, is your mic on? I'm not sure. Um, it is. It is. I'm just not talking into it. Okay, let's see. What do you want me to pull off now? A2. Uh, item oh, A3. A2. Okay. Oh, A3. A3. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so, Administration and Public Works met this evening, and um, the first item we discussed was A1, and that is Resolution 18R18, Good to Go, Jamaican Cuisine uh, Request for Financial Assistance, and that is off the consent agenda. Um, A2 is, so A3 is off, right? That's correct, not okay. A2 from staff. Um, a2 is on the consent agenda. That is um, ordinance 33018. I believe that might be off. off That's maybe. off. Yes. Okay. Is A3 on? A3 is I, off. I may leave that on. Okay. Off. So is everything off? Yes. Okay. So there is no consent agenda. <laughs> Moving right along, Economic okay. Development Committee. Um, I'm, uh, may I leave that on the consent agenda, Madam Mayor? Yes, you may. Okay. Uh, hearing no objections. Um, Economic Development Committee, uh, the Evanston Great Merchants Grant uh, is, uh, we're requesting that you uh, approve awarding that to Herrera Landscape and Snow Removal for the 2018 Business Districts Planter and Landscape Improvement. Um, that is for um, the amount of $32,569. And I move approval. Second. All right. All those in favor of the consent agenda? Uh, that's a budget item. We oh, have budget to take item. Sorry. the roll. Sorry. Um, would you take the roll on the consent agenda? Um, Clerk Reed. Alderman Rainey. Aye. Alderman Fleming. Aye. Alderman Fisk. Aye. Alderman Wynn. Aye. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman uh, Rue Simmons. Aye. Alderman Sufferton. Aye. Alderman Ravel. Okay. okay, so that is the, our item on the consent agenda. Okay, would you like me to make a committee report now? Yes, please. Okay. Um, A1 is Resolution 18R18, Good to Go Jamaican Cuisine, Requests uh, for Financial Assistance. Um, the committee voted, uh, was it two to two, I believe? I that three to one. Three to one. Um, requests uh, approval of a $25,000 loan for 
um, completion of their property at 711 Howard Street. Um, they have another $25,000 loan, and this will allow them to open in April. Um, it's an amazing operation there. This is not a city-owned property as many of the other um, economic development projects on Howard Street are. Um, the Levy family purchased, this is Tony and Lenise Levy, who are also 8th Ward residents. They have had a, a store on the Chicago side of Howard Street. They've been renting for 20 years and have been doing a, a wonderful business. They've purchased 7-Eleven, um, and I believe it was 709 Howard Street, which they knocked down and um, have expanded the 7-Eleven Howard Street, a beautiful project. 7-Eleven um, Howard Street was off the tax rolls. It was a church. So once this property goes on the tax rolls, it will be a total increment into the TIF. It's not been on the tax rolls. It's very exciting. Um, liquor license, all that money will be new money on Howard Street. And there, if you've not driven past, it's, it's just beautiful. They had some overage with their contractors, some issues with the roof that they had no idea were going to occur. But a building of that ilk and of that age, you just don't know until you get there. We've had this conversation about other city projects. This is not a city project, but people who do renovations of this kind find those kinds of problems. So they ended up a little short right at the end and they have some major events that they've booked. Maybe they shouldn't have been so excited about booking things, but uh, they did. And so in order to make those deadlines, they need to pay these contractors. And so anyway, it's a 10-year loan for $25,000. It's money worth spending, I think, and I move approval. Second. Discussion? All right. Presenting. I, um, City Clerk, would you call wait, Alderman Fisk? I guess I, I'll ask the question. Um, so it's half the um, half of the budget, uh, the balance in the uh, economic development business attraction uh, budget has uh, a balance of fifty thousand dollars, and this is half of that. Can staff just tell us what's what else might be out there that would be asking for money from this account? Thank you, Alderman Fisk. I'm Paul Zamazak, economic development manager. Um, that particular account, um, frankly, had uh, what I had hoped would happen with the budget this year was that we had one single account that was attraction, retention, and expansion. Um, this particular account was a separated account for attraction work. Um, I like to say that all of our work is is kind of it's 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 in a hole. So really, we have three hundred thousand dollars for that kind of work. Most of our work is retention work. We're not out pounding the pavement to attract businesses here. We have to spend our time retaining the great businesses that we have here. So. Okay, because I mean we've we've heard from Annie Coakley, for example, of the hard work that she and others are doing to attract right. businesses. Sure, we we do that, but we don't we don't spend the money on to do that. That's just showing them love and, and bringing them here and showing them around. But we don't have to invest in, in the new businesses who come here. We don't tell them that there's help for them we if they're storefront modernization program things like that. But that's what I'm saying. We have the two hundred fifty thousand plus the fifty, which makes a total of three hundred thousand. Okay, okay. Thank you. All right, I see no more lights. City Clerk, would you call the roll? Alderman Rainey? Aye. Alderman Fleming? Aye. Alderman Fisk? Alderman uh, Wilson? Aye. Alderman Nguyen? Aye. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Aye. Alderman Suffredin? No. Alderman Ravel? Aye. All right, seven to one. Uh, the resolution uh, passes. All right, Alderman Rainey, A2. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Ordinance 33018 amends the city code section 346 by creating the new Class F2 liquor license. 
Um, this is a license uh, for a retail liquor dealer gourmet food and amenity store. The ordinance um, has been in committee back and forth and um, was in uh, committee this evening where we amended um, two items. One is the license, uh, the original license fee to uh, be $45,000 with the renewal fee being um, $15,000, and I move approval of those two items. Second. Also, I move uh, suspension of the rules and action. Uh, the committee voted um, for that as well. Two to two. Is there a second on Second. This? All right. All those in favor of suspension of the rules, please say aye. 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 The committee did vote to suspend the rules. I beg your pardon? Let me ask a question. When's our next meeting? Wait, wait, wait. Just, just wait, just wait. Let me explain this, why this is so important. We have held this up for three weeks, which is one week longer than introducing and then having a discussion and then bringing it to the second council meeting. This is, this is more than is necessary, but we did not have a quorum, and that is really unfair to, um, to the applicant, I think. Okay, and I'm, I, I'm for, as I'm sitting here, I'm, I guess I forgot that we are not having the meeting next week. So yes, that's true. without that, and we don't have a meeting the 1st of April, so the next meeting would be when, City Manager? Yes. Uh, April the 9th. April 9th. Okay. So All right. quite a, a four weeks. All right, and given the circumstances with that uh, lack of quorum in the prior committee meeting when it would have otherwise been entertained, uh, I would I would support the suspension of the rules. Okay, I, I will go I will go along with that, but I, I really think we need to have this on on agenda so that everyone in the public can see that we're, we're going to be voting on it on the same night. I've said that before, and I want to be consistent about that because otherwise uh, the public is surprised, and it uh, it just does not look transparent. Thank you. Well, we've, 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 I if I could just argue in favor of this because it's, you know, it, I don't have No, I think right. Alderman Wilson said it well, and I... Uh, right. But it, it has been... It has been bandied about, and it really is the committee's fault that it, this has happened because I do, I, the city manager said when the last time we didn't have a quorum, and we did not have a quorum, and that's, that's our fault. It's nobody else's fault. No, I, I understand okay. that. All right. Okay. So it's unanimous. Yeah, okay. All right. Alderman Fleming. No, I just, I, I'm going to support this, but I wanted to explain because I, just 30 minutes ago said no. <laughs> so I, I did the numbers because I wanted to make sure it was fair and, and Benny's and Evanston first, for those who care, um, are just within sense of each other if you break it down cost per square foot for their liquor license. So that was important to me to find out and so I will support this um, amendment. Okay. Thank you. Well, no more lights? Um, I have one thing to say. Yes. Alderman Rainey. I think that was very good work, Alderman Fleming, but I was here when Evanston first liquors, and nobody was treated better. Nobody was treated better than Evanston first liquors. So just so you know, they were. Well, I was hoping to pay their first No, year. I know. I, they, they were treated so well and were, were the beneficiaries of being the only liquor store for so long. So they they really did well and, and they know it and they were very appreciative for all those years. So anyway. Thank you, Alderman Rainey and Alderman Fleming. Um, City Clerk, would you call the roll? Alderman Rainey? Yes. Nope. That's been this voted is for on. action. Suspension of the rules was unanimous, and then now we're voting on the uh, amended right. yes. orders. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Alderman Rainey. Yes. Alderman Fleming. Yes. Alderman Fisk. Alderman Braithwaite. Yes. Alderman Wynn. Yes. Alderman Wilson. Yes. Alderman Ruth Simmons. Yes. Alderman Sufferden. No. Alderman Ravel. Aye. Seven to two. Uh, the motion. The ordinance uh, carries.
All right, moving on to A3. Yes. Um, ordinance 31018 amends the city code 346 by creating the new Class X liquor license. Um, local liquor commissioner rec recommends the city council adopt that we adopt sec uh, ordinance 31018, um, which creates a new Class X liquor license, uh, which uh, will allow arts and crafts studios the sale of beer and wine for on-site consumption. This was introduced February 26, um, and uh, was referred back to the committee. This uh, removes the requirement that it be that the the established that the license include a, a, a type two food uh, requirement and allows them to have packaged food. Um, in place of the larger requirement of uh, food. In other words, there's no requirement for um, sinks and, you know, health department requirements. So packaged food and the Class X license. I move approval. Second. This Mayor is for time. action. Yes. City Manager. Uh, Assistant City Attorney McKay uh, passed out the uh, revised ordinance. So on the top of that is the date 3-15-2018. So this is a revised ordinance uh, from the ordinance that was in the packet. Um, you can see uh, it is redlined on the top of page 2. Um, section 3 um, defines the uh, uh, packaged foods, limited food services, cheese cracker, snack food, or other similar deli items. Um, and I think that is the, the major change. So we would ask that the ordinance be adopted as amended. Alderman Fisk. Um, when, when we first talked about this, I, I joked to staff saying, gosh, when are we going to have a um, application for welding and serving, serving alcohol? And this comes really close to that. So I'm, I, I, I am concerned. I mean, an arts and crafts studio is defined as a place kept, used, maintained, advertised, or held out to the public as a place in which the public may participate in activities that include painting, ceramics, woodworking, and craft design and construction projects utilizing fibers, metal, wood, or glass. I mean, it seems to me that's overly broad. I do not want to see anyone using power tools and drinking. Uh, I know that sounds a little funny, but that's the way this can be interpreted, and I think it's I think it's too loose. I also don't think that we have to drink at every activity that we have. I think there there are some um, some activities that we uh, can maybe not do that. So I would like that um, the um, uh, definition of the arts and crafts studio to be more uh, more narrowly defined. Well, then amend it. Amend it. I'm not sh quite sure how to amend it. How to, power draw, tools. Um, draw a line through. Power tools, fire. Um, uh, what, what else is there? I, I, you know, I wasn't thinking I would be amending this on the fly since we were handed it 10 I know, minutes I know. ago. I never saw so. this before. Okay. Alderman Wilson. Um, I, the applicant's here, right? Yes. Okay. Maybe they could just give us a better explanation on... Um, you know, hopefully nobody's going to be operating a kiln or, you know, it's take welding working. or anything like no, that. So maybe tell us what that is going to look like so we can tailor the language to make it suitable for what you're going to be doing. This is board and brush. It's where the 136th location to open and every other location has a liquor license to serve wine and beer at this studio. It's meant to be a place where families during the day can come and make wood projects. And at night, it is in the point when wine and beer will be served. It's girls night out husband and wife coming and they're making wood signs for their house so their or their home wood decor so essentially it, what it entails is taking pieces of plywood and sanding them down and distressing them and then you get a stencil that's pre-printed printed by us that say like welcome to our home or our address and then we give you the stencil and then they stain the wood and they paint it it's a it's a fun meant to be fun process for people to enjoy a night out and make something for their home 
and uh, other 135 locations do exactly this and serve and have wine and beer available. Not everybody drinks, some people do. I'd say of the ones I've been to, half of them do one glass of wine. Their hands are very busy, but it's meant to be a social occasion where you would come as a group gathering and celebration. Many people make their wedding signs there and it's meant to be a celebrational fun activity. So it's just the way the franchise was built. We're simply the franchisee and we abide by their rules and have chosen Evanston for our second business here and that's the rules of the franchise. So we're here to ask to do the same. Okay, and that's that's more or less what I expected. I th and um, from a logistics perspective, what we're doing is we're passing a class of liquor license so theoretically other people could come along and you know apply for this. And uh, to Alderman uh, Fisk's very good point is you know we wouldn't want people operating dangerous equipment, which it's clear that that's not what they're doing at your location. But I think maybe we just need to adjust this a little bit to um, um, to cover that. I'm not sure. Yeah, we won't be welding or anything. I need like one minute to think about it. Yeah. So. If, right. Okay. Yeah, is this pre-cut? It comes in from a distributor cut to the size of its cut. So the only thing they're doing is sand. sanding. They're sanding, and, and they can take and they can take a um, a hammer or a, a meat cleaver and distress the wood. Mm -hmm. So it's like a five-minute thing where they're going like this with the wood. But but no, but the wine is not available till that. It's the first five minutes of the class. So we don't even offer it or serve it before okay. that is done. It's the so, first five minutes. So you're saying that when when. Then, when implements are being used that could potentially be harmful, alcohol is not being served. No, it's they walk in, they get their spot, they go to their spot where their stencil's pre cut, they approve their stencil, and we're talking to them. And then they so we say, Now you're going to distress your wood, and they distress the wood. We take those items away, and then we turn on music and we explain it, and then we turn on music, and then people can ask us if they would like to purchase. We also don't like walk around and say, Would you like to drink? It's just there they can come up and ask for it if they would like. If you, if, I think that I, I, you know that makes perfect sense to me, and I think um, oh. I, I don't know that I would necessarily use that activity, but but nevertheless, will empty bottles be around that people can hit one another with? No, not at all. I mean, really, people really. I think that I don't think your insurance cover cover would allow you to serve alcohol with power tools. Happen at the no, same time. No, all all other 135 locations have an insurance policy that allows them to serve the beer and wine, and there's a limit. So wait, during the hammering? No, and, no, and I mean, no, no, no. That's my point. So right, and it's the first five minutes. It's not a big, and then they're literally staining and painting and sanding and right. using their okay. hands and chatting and having a nice time. It's meant to be a fun thing for the... I have two other aldermen, Alderman Braithwaite and then Alderman Fisk. Oh, thank you, Alderman. I'm just trying to look up your business online. Sure. In Boardandbrush.com. Boardandbrush. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Alderman Fisk. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to what Alderman Wilson um, is thinking um, <laughs> because I think he's I, he's identified the problem. It's... it's and no one is taking issue with your if, with your business. It's the way that that's this written. ordinance is yeah. written that's the problem. Um, because while you're following all the rules, it's not clear enough that there are protections built in. Um, so I just I wanted to make that clear. Yeah, that sure. makes sense. Yeah, we're not going to be welding. I don't think people should weld so and drink either. You're, yeah. <laughs> How about if we added um, at the end of paragraph one, which is in paragraph and page one nineteen? No, it's not. Uh, in the new draft, so there's a new draft here. Um, in the new draft, you know, arts and craft studios defined as blah blah blah, adding a sentence that says something like power tools or hazardous equipment may not be utilized while alcohol be ha alcoholic beverages are being served. Would that work? Um, um, yeah, yeah. It depends on what you define as a power tool. I mean, we do have to like screw in back, like you have to screw in like the hangers at the end, you know, like to hang on your wall. Okay. Yeah, I, you do power tool. Powered, just a screwdriver. No, powered like cutting a power, tools. It's probably a power well, screwdriver. Power What's that? Okay. It's a power about, screwdriver. Okay. Yeah. How about this? How about powered cutting? And we tools. do it for them, but. I don't know if that helps, but we, at the end we have to like finish the project off and put things in the back, and oh, the staff so, does it. So the staff puts that in. Yeah, we help with that and do it unless they really, really want to do it themselves. But I don't. Yeah. I've never seen anyone really. Okay, want so to do it. how about powered cutting tools or there hazardous equipment cannot be used by patrons or staff who are drinking, consuming, consuming alcohol. alcohol. Sure, that sounds good. Okay, All right. Did somebody get that? We got it. Okay. All right. 
right. So I move that we amend paragraph one to reflect the language I just stated. Second. All right. All those in favor of the ordinance as amended, uh, would you call the roll? Yes. We have some questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see your light. Oh, I'm, I apologize. Alderman Fleming and then Alderman Rainey. I've, City Manager, can you check my light? It, it's, the, it's the computer screen. I'm just no. joking. No, okay. No, no. Yeah. Um, my question was actually back for you again. You mentioned that in the daytime it's families, and I, I know that I live behind Little Beans and you serve liquor and so far it's been okay um so you, there won't be a liquor for sale during the day i think that was my so I, I don't want to amend but does it make sense since she has said there's not liquor available during the day do we need to amend the time just as we're or are we okay with leaving it like this i only brought it up because you said there's no liquor during the day yeah no it's like we we do very few their kids are teen workshops and they're done like on saturday mornings and we don't it's not even available at that time so okay all right thank you Okay, Alderman Rainey? No. Okay. All right. Crazy. Okay, so now, uh, Clerk Reed, would you call the roll, yes. please? Alderman Rainey? Yes. Alderman Fleming? Yes. Alderman Fisk? Alderman Braithwaite? Yep. Alderman Wynn? Yes. Alderman Wilson? Yes. Alderman Ruth Simmons? Yes. Alderman Suffernan? Yes. And Alderman Ravel? Yes. All right. All right. Uh, eight to one, the ordinance passes. Thank you very much. Okay. So now we will return to our uh, the beginning portion of our agenda, the special orders of business. Madam Mayor, pro tem members of the council, uh, we're pleased uh, to have a number of uh, reports on current issues for you this evening. The first, uh, Kumar Jensen, our sustainability coordinator, is here uh, to give an update on the Climate Action Resilient Plan, Resilience Plan Working Group update. And of course, we all know the Climate Action Resilience Plan really is CARP. So uh, uh, we will get a report on our CARP update. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, members of the City Council, Clerk Reed, uh, Manager Bob Quitz. I'm Kumar Jensen, uh, Sustainability Coordinator for the City. <clears throat> I'm, I'm nursing a little bit of a sore throat, so I apologize. Um, uh, this evening, I'm here to provide an update uh, about the progress that the climate, the CARP has taken in the past uh, about six months since they were formed last fall. I also have the two co-chairs of CARP, uh, Lauren Marquez Viso and Joel Freeman. Uh, Lauren will be joining me up here in a minute to walk you through a few of the slides. Um, and so back in uh, September of 2017, the mayor created the uh, this group, and the intent of the group was to lead the community in our third iteration of climate action planning. The big difference with this one is that we're also adding in not just thinking about how do we reduce our carbon emissions and our carbon footprint, but as we're starting to see actual impacts and effects of climate change, what do we do as a community to prepare and plan for that? And so this plan is really a two-part plan. Uh, includes the, the climate action component and also the climate resilience component. And Lauren will get into that a little bit. So uh, in order to do this really important work, uh, the mayor selected 17 community members. Uh, Lauren and Joel are the co-chairs. Uh, we have one uh, high school student. These are the rest of the members. They meet monthly, sometimes more frequently. They're a very active group. Uh, they have a couple task forces that also break out and focus on some of these individual components. Uh, they meet on Tuesdays. Uh, and one thing that is a little bit unique about this group is we do have a sunset date. And so this group will actually, in its bylaws, will uh, cease to exist exist at the end of 2018. So the plan that will be brought uh, by this group will be brought to the City Council in October is our plan of this year, and I'll get into the timeline uh, towards the end. So I'd like to invite Lauren up uh, to walk you through the next set of slides, and then I'll come back up and finish out the timeline and um, answer any questions you have. Thanks, Kumar. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren Marquez Viso. I live in the second ward on 1533 Dempster Street. I have lived in Evanston for about seven years and worked in Evanston at Rotary International for going on 10 years. So I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about well, what are we talking about when we say climate action and climate resilience. So the climate action piece of it describes actions that reduce the release of greenhouse gas emissions such as carbon dioxide and methane. 
design. And the adaptation or resiliency piece of the plan is a task of evaluating the changing climate and preparing our community for the changes and the impact that they will have on our community and its residents and infrastructure. So greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane are pollutants that are released primarily from burning fossil fuels, so gasoline, natural gas, oil, coal. And the greenhouse gases are becoming trapped in our atmosphere, causing not only poor air quality, but the warming of the planet. So this is what is resulting in climate change. So the effects of climate change are negatively impacting environmental and human health. While climate change is an, an extremely large global phenomenon that Evanston itself cannot control, it impacts Evanston directly, and so our city is playing a role in fighting it. So with climate change and its, its impact in mind, we need to be planning for a warmer, wetter climate. We also need to be resilient and be able to adapt as our climate changes. So climate change in Evanston, what does this look like? So these type of headlines will become more and more common as climate change accelerates and we continue to feel its effects here in Evanston. So this is some predicted future climate data specifically for Evanston. Data demonstrates that Evanston will warm significantly under current scenarios. So think about having almost 40 days a year with temperatures over 90 degrees. In addition to the threats of heat stress, we know that hotter days are typically worse air quality days as well. We've already seen the powerful impact of microbursts and we can expect even more heavy storms as time goes on with subsequent flooding and damage even if overall precipitation may not change much. Winters are also growing shorter, and with fewer days below freezing, that allows for more pests, invasive species, and vectors like mosquitoes carrying diseases that are able to thrive longer in Evanston. We all know about the emerald ash borer, for example, and its impact that it has had on our beautiful trees in our city. The growing season continues to be longer, and while temperatures increase, and there are also increased levels of carbon dioxide, this is actually causing plants to grow more vigorously and increase pollen production, which exacerbates allergies and respiratory issues. With all of this in mind, we are building off of previous successes like the 2014 Livability Plan. So these are just a few examples of some of the impacts that we're witnessing and that we can expect to be um, increase over time. So while any single storm or extreme weather event cannot be attributed to climate change, the overall pattern of increasingly extreme weather events is strongly linked to climate change. We can say that with certainty, if we continue on this current path, even with our past progress, these events will become more frequent in a warmer, wetter climate. So to tackle this, we need some bold and ambitious action. So we talked a little bit about the emerald ash borer and what the devastating effects that it has had on our trees. So it's decimated our public ash population from 4,200 trees down to 700, which is pretty dramatic out of huge cost to the city. So trees provide millions of dollars in community benefits to Evanston through cooling, carbon sequestration, stormwater absorption, shade, windbreaks, habitat, walkable streets, and increased property values. So our ash trees have been devastated by the emerald ash border, and the increasingly warm climate will allow invasives and pests like the emerald ash borer to thrive in our climate. These are just some of the health threats that we can be sure that we will be experiencing um, as time goes on. So heat stroke, dehydration, aggravated cardiovascular illness, water-related infection, vector-borne disease, mental health issues, and the vulnerable populations will be the hardest hit by these impacts. So those include infants and youth, the elderly, people with disabilities, people with mental illness, those with limited means. So I want to bring Kumar back up here to talk about our past successes and to talk a little bit more about what we expect to achieve with CARP. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Lauren. Um, 
So as Lauren mentioned, uh, the the city has done two previous climate action plans. Both of them were focused exclusively on uh, reducing carbon emissions. The most recent one was the 2014 livability plan, which sort of sunsetted ex or expired at the end of 2016. That plan was incredibly successful. We, on our first sort of round of evaluating it, um, the goal was a 20 percent reduction in community-wide emissions, and we hit we got to 19. And if you think about and you look at the other communities around the country that are in their third wave of climate action planning, that's a very, very small number. And among the group that have have, have done two plans, I'm not sure uh, there are more than five or six that have said they've, they've been able to hit that 20 percent reduction. So we have a very solid ground to stand on as we move forward. And even uh, sort of more impressive is that as we're recalculating and doing a little bit more intensive effort this year around planning, we actually think that our revised numbers are going to are going to put us closer to 25 percent reduction, which um, is really, uh, really impressive. Um, and so you may have heard some of these uh, commitments or some of these organizations um, in the climate world. There are, there are almost more commitments than there are um, cities, so we are a part of a lot of them. These are the big ones uh, that have gotten a lot of press. Obviously, our star our star rating, uh, we were just recertified as the the first uh, U.S. city to get recertified as a four star. Um, and so these goals on the right side, those are ones that sort of correlate to these five commitments over here on the left, right? So some of them are overlapping, like the Chicago Climate Charter, the Global Covenant of Mayors, and the Climate Mayors, all are um, aligned with the pair agreement, so that 26 to 28 percent reduction. So if we recalculate our numbers and we're at 25 percent, we're doing pretty darn good for, for a goal for 2025, but we need to be more um, ambitious. And so that's where these goals for 100 percent clean energy and an 80 percent reduction uh, by 2050 come into play. So thinking about sort of the nuts and bolts of what, what you're going to see next, this is our timeline. This is CARP's timeline for engagement um, and for sort of uh, moving through the process. They, they kicked off the planning process back in uh, September. We're now entering the phase of, of open community engagement. And so CARP is, has started to plan and actually has on the calendar quite a few events already where they will be going or I will be going and presenting to community groups and then soliciting feedback through facilitated conversations. And so we are really looking for uh, community organizations or individuals that are interested in participating and hopefully co-hosting those events as well, um, just knowing how limited our reach can be. So that process will run through the end of May. Then we'll uh, work on drafting a plan, and we hope to have that done a uh, pretty quick turnaround in, in mid-July. Uh, we will then release that plan for public comment. Um, we'd like to have it out there for six weeks so people can hear uh, and see sort of how their feedback was incorporated. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, in October, we'll bring, bring back the final plan. So the last thing I'll say is this is uh, just a sample of some of the events that we already have on the books and some of the ones that we're in conversations about. Earlier um, this month, you should have received an invitation uh, from me um, uh, related to hosting um, award events or having a CARP uh, group come and talk to, talk at a ward meeting, that offer and invitation still stands. Or if there are other groups in your ward that you work with that you think um, you want to make sure I'm aware of that should be participating, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd be glad to work with them. So thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you. And, and Madam Mayor, pro tem, before Mr. Jensen uh, sits down, uh, I, I think the point that he kind of just glossed over is that we're one of probably just a handful of communities on a third iteration of a climate action plan. Mm -hmm. um, and so that we have been able to uh, not only get uh, resources within the city government, but probably more importantly, the resources outside the city government, or our community leaders, our community organizations, our business, the business community, uh, the schools, uh, Northwestern, District 65, District 202. Um, we, we really stand as a leader uh, nationally. Uh, at this, and as we have broadened our our scope to uh, uh, the Star Communities Program, one has to remember that the the, the, the climate and resiliency is only a piece of that. Um, and so we are, are fortunate to have Mr. Jensen focus on that specific piece. We have many others in the organization worrying about other components of livability, but it really all started with environmental sustainability. Uh, and uh, we want to really thank Mr. Jensen for his leadership um, as we move through, because come the end of 
the year. Again, we'll probably be less than a dozen, half dozen communities in America that will have completed three uh, climate action plans. So, Mr. Jensen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jensen, may I ask you a question? Of course. Um, this sort of piggybacking off what the city manager just said, uh, how is uh, Cook County and our region doing in terms of this type of planning and these types of goals? Um, I would say uh, as a region, there is not a lot of cohesive effort. There are some isolated plans, and most of the work that we see at the county or even uh, with the city of Chicago are focused more on internal operations rather than legislating or, or working with the community to do community-wide planning, which is what, what this is, right? It includes city operations, but it's not... It's not just city operations. So I think with the passage of the Future Energy Jobs Act in 2016, we're starting to see a lot of people move in that direction based on a lot of the funding that's becoming available for solar. Um, and so we're seeing a lot more, but there's not a whole lot out there in Illinois right now um, to, uh, to sort of work on. Do you hear from our neighbors like Skokie and Wilmette uh, on, or, or other, any of our other neighbors going north on how they can do this type of um, similar program in their communities? I would say that I hear more from residents or organizations within those communities than I do of other um, officials uh, within those communities. Uh, there's a group called Go Green Illinois, which is very active. Um, and so I'm, I attend those meetings occasionally, but those are there are more staff that are attending those meetings than there were three years ago. Um, and then there's also the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. Uh, Edith Makra, who chairs or uh, staffs their environment committee, has been working on some of this more collaborative um, and joint uh, efforts primarily around um, energy. And, and climate. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, I, I, I suppose it's helpful that it's getting better, but we are such a small portion of our general area. It would be helpful if others would were doing the same type of work, even if they were a little bit behind us. <laughs> so, right. so thank you very much, and thank you to the Climate Action Group, too. This is, this is a very interesting project. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Next, City Manager. Uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Fire Chief Brian Scott is here. Uh, he wanted to come and uh, share with you uh, some uh, outcomes from last year. Uh, Chief Scott, good evening. Thank you. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council, City Clerk Reed, City Manager Bobkowitz, good evening, good evening Fire Chief Brian Scott. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, the 2017 EFD annual report. Our mission for the department, the reason why we exist, is to protect life and property. We've done that with distinction since 1875. Our core values, which we take very seriously around every fire department patch on every uniform, is service, professionalism, and tradition. These kind of characterize the personality of the organization and they refer to service in terms of our duty, our sworn duty, serve the community, professionalism, ensure that we, ensuring that we maintain the highest levels of knowledge and skill, and tradition, which refers to preserving and caring for the honored legacy of those who have served with distinction over the last 143 years. It's all been encapsulated in a phrase that we like to say, for others with distinction, faithful to our heritage. I really feel that this mission and our values align very nicely with the, with the mission and values of the city itself, where we try to create the most livable city in the United States, along the values of excellent customer service, continuous improvement, integrity, and accountability. As fire chief, I directly lead a command staff of three division chiefs and three administrative staff, comprised of an administrative secretary, plan reviewer, and management analyst. As you can see from the chart, that middle section there is Division Chief Paul Pollop, who serves as our fire and EMS operations chief. He's also our public information officer. Division Chief Dwight Hull leads the Fire Prevention Bureau and also serves as the city, city's emergency preparedness manager. And Division Chief Glenn Vanek, who is on the far right there, he leads the department's specialized operations, like technical rescue, and also serves as the department's professional development and training officer. I'd like to now kind of break down numbers for 2017. And as you can see here, for the second consecutive year, the second time in our 143 year history, we've eclipsed 10,000 emergency runs for service. The prime number of those is, is EMS 
at about 64%. And if we look at trends over a 30-year period, you can see that since 1988, we've had a 51% increase in our call volume since that time. And again, the prime driver here is EMS with about a 61% increase in EMS runs over that period of time. I think of all the numbers that I can present to you this evening, these are probably the most important. They're very mission critical numbers. You can see here once again, we have outstanding response times. Our response time on average for 2017 was three minutes and 15 seconds, which is well, well below the NFPA standard of four minutes. And why does this matter? Well, it really is critical to fire and life safety. You can see there that we had over 90 fires in 2017 and we were able to save over 98% of the property involved. In fact, out of those 90 fires, only five reached the box alarm level where we had to kind of reach out to our neighbors in the area for assistance. That plays a large part, that our, our response times play a big part in that, coupled with our staffing. You'll also see that we had no fire fatalities in 2017, and that's the fifth consecutive year that we were able to do that. When we talk about emergency medical services, I think you can all agree that the sooner we can get to someone that's having an acute medical condition or traumatic injury, the better their chances of survival. In fact, the American Heart Association has done some excellent research where they've, where they've learned that really to, to increase survivability in a cardiac arrest, we have to give them advanced life support and defibrillation within just the first few minutes of a cardiac arrest. Every minute that there's a delay, their survivability decreases by 10%. So these response times really make a difference. We're so fortunate to have the times that we have here in the city of Evanston, and we're very proud of that fact that we get to people so quickly. The second component, as I mentioned, is staffing. And each day we staff the city with 26 firefighter paramedics, and they're um, placed at different fire stations around the city, strategically placed in five different locations. Overall staffing for the department is 110. That ISO rating refers to our public protection classification. Basically, it's an industry standard that determines how well we can fight fires. Our, cur our current classification is a two, which places us at about 1.8% of all fire departments in the nation. This level of achievement really isn't possible without continuous improvements in our fire response and looking really hard at our community risk reduction component within the city. And of course, we can't do it without great collaboration with our water department, and our emergency communications center. We also use this industry feedback to benchmark our performance, measure our program effectiveness, and kind of plan for future improvements. We continue to have a lot of community engagement through our Fire Prevention Bureau and Fire Prevention Activities. You'll see here that we are two inspectors along with our plan reviewer, and we get some good support from our on-duty shift personnel whenever possible. We do a lot of great things in the community to proactively look at community risk reduction and prevent emergencies. Over 673 field inspections. We do life safety plan reviews, arson investigations. We do oversight for special events to make sure that their life, they're meeting life safety code and compliance. And we've done over 268 public education activities with probably the most popular being our block parties. Our Fire Explorer program continues to be a great success. In fact, it's one of the biggest Explorer programs in the state of Illinois. Here, young adults, ages 14 to 20, learn about the profession of being a firefighter paramedic, as well as learn important life skills like leadership, strong work ethic, and serving the community. We have over 34 members currently in the program, and we've graduated 80 since its inception in 2012. Another added benefit for the Fire Explorer program is that these members get preference points if they were to test for our new firefighter eligibility list. Another great program that allows the youth of Evanston to learn about public safety is the Evanston Township Public Safety Program. So we do this program in collaboration with the Evanston Police Department and Oakton Community College along with ETHS. This program is directed towards juniors and seniors and they learn about the careers of firefighter, paramedic, and police officer, um, how to prepare for that career, as well as uh, get cross or dual credit between the high school and Oakton Community College towards an associate's degree. So it's a very successful program. 13 students in the program right now, over 200 since its inception.
Our CERT program right now has 24 members, and the Community Emergency Response Team is a group of dedicated volunteers that go through specialized training in areas like basic uh, disaster response skills, light search and rescue, and first aid. And in the event of a serious man-made or natural disaster in the city of Evanston, our Office of Emergency Preparedness could actually kind of mobilize this group of these volunteers, and they could assist us in helping the community or their place of business when first responders might be at a premium. Our citizen CPR program continues to be a success. As you can see here, over 300 people certified in 2017, 1,500 overall since 2012. And again, the, uh, the genesis of this program was, was very simple. As, as experienced paramedics, we all realize the fact that our success in the field many times is determined by the quality of CPR before our arrival. So we, we learn very quickly that the more people we can train with this life-saving skill, the more we can have a positive impact on the community when it comes to cardiac arrest. So this is the kind of the mission of this program, and it's been very successful not only for the general public, but we also do some great training for healthcare professionals in the city of Evanston. Some other highlights from 2017 would include Fire Ops 101, which I know many of you personally participated in, and we certainly thank you. Fire Ops 101 was a great collaboration between the Evanston and Skokie Fire Departments and our respective IAFF affiliates, in which you had the opportunity to learn hands-on what our members do each and every day. As I mentioned, Evanston is, is nationally recognized for our efforts in developing and maintaining an emergency response system that really delivers the proper resources in a time-critical way over 10,000 times a year. As important decision makers, it's really critical that you, the, you make the most informed decisions possible when it comes to our equipment, our apparatus, and our staffing. So firefighting is very tough, labor-intensive and time-critical, and I hope that experience gave you a little bit of an indication of what it takes to do the job each and every day, and we very much thank you for your participation in Fire Ops 101. The Illinois Emergency Management Agency, or IEMA, requires us every two years just to do basic revisions of our emergency operations plan. Chief Hall really took this opportunity and completely revamped our plan so it better reflects all hazards, best practices around the country, and really better address contemporary man-made threats. So Chief Hall did an outstanding job with this particular project, and now he's looking forward to enhancing our evacuation, shelter-in-place, and resource management plans to better accommodate special needs populations in the city, like the elderly, the blind, and the disabled. Also in 2017, we were able, through great cooperation with the Telecommunication Center, upgrade our computer-aided dispatch, or CAD, along with our new fire reporting system. So already, this thing has proven itself to be more reliable, giving us more timely information. So we're hoping to see these re um, response times even reduce even more because of this. And already, we're seeing better data and records management. We were able, in 2017, to offer advanced cardiac life support training to all our paramedics. And ACLS is the most advanced training you can get in pre-hospital care for cardiac arrest. So what it does is allow our paramedics to learn the latest techniques procedures and equipment when it comes to dealing with cardiac arrest. We try to get this training done every few years. In years past, when we looked at public education for our students in Evanston, we used to just focus on a week within October to, to execute that training within a select number of schools. And we thought we could do better, and we have. So now we, we kind of expand that public education across the entire year, and we were very successful in, in giving education to all District 65 kindergartners through fifth grade. That's over 4,000 students that were given important training in fire safety, life safety training, home hazards, and even how to dial 911. Taking the opportunity as the new fire chief in 2017, I made sure that our strategic plan, which will conclude in 2020, was updated. We held community meetings across uh, the city to get some feedback from the community on the plan, as well as um, try to explain the plan in detail with our command staff. We also took this opportunity to do a, a survey through the web to kind of gauge their community expectations for the fire department. So we thought that was very beneficial as well. 
as we look ahead to 2018, we're going to be uh, expanding our ranks with, with some new higher testing. Now, we've already completed the, the enhanced recruitment process, and now we're in that support phase of this. So basically what we're doing now is offering support sessions for these candidates on how to take a written test. On the 14th, we'll be doing some uh, support sessions at Sectum Baptist Church on how to take oral interviews and prepare for those interviews and even how to write a resume. So, so far the support sessions have been very beneficial. We have over 300 people that are applying for the job of firefighter paramedic, so I'll keep you posted throughout that process. In cooperation with Northwestern University, we're gonna be working on an agreement for a shared emergency operations center that will allow the city to have a state-of-the-art EOC and do it in a very mindful economic way with a great partner in Northwestern University. Dwight Hull as Emergency Preparedness Manager will continue to work with all city departments to enhance our preparedness, our NIMS compliance, as well as he take, he's taking a more proactive approach with the business community to help them better prepare for a disaster in the city, as well as work with them on continuity of our operations. We'll be offering, oh, excuse me, we'll be offering um, NFA, which is the National Fire Academy, Incident Safety Officer Program to all our firefighters, as well as Pediatric Advanced Life Support Training, which is very similar to ACLS, but we're gonna be dealing with children. In cooperation with the Telecommunication Center and IT, we're gonna be upgrading our pre-planning software. Now, pre-planning software is really important to us. Basically, it's gonna allow a, a fire officer in route to an emergency to be able to get critical building information, for example, what hazards are in the building. He'll be able to get photos of, a, of all four sides of the building and the roof so he can make important strategic and tactical decisions in route to the call so they can operate quickly and efficiently and safely as possible. So that pre-planning software is going to be going in before the end of the summer. We also have... Chief uh, Scott, yes, I, I have um, Alderman Braithwaite who had a question. Oh, certainly. Uh, Thank you, Alderman Wynn, and, and thank you, Chief Scott. I just, when you flip this slide, it reminds me of a conversation that we've had in the past, and, and I want to thank you very much. I know you've come out to mine and, and other members of council's uh, ward meetings just talking about the wonderful opportunity for Evanston residents to uh, become members of the fire department. I guess my, my follow-up question is, are there any plans to change legislation or to uh, add a local preference to the recruitment process. The last time it was explained to me by Chief Kleiberg, it has to do with you know certain regulations downstate, but are you working on anything in the future to make changes? Alderman Braithwaite, thank you for the question. Um, actually, yes. Um, so first, we, we definitely in the short term have done some great expanded recruitment, and it's been Evanston focused. But uh, you're right, there are some legislative barriers with the Firefighter Hiring Act that, that have kind of worked against us in this regard. So already we've had some pretty good success. I've already met with the uh, State Firefighters Union, the AFFI, as well as the State Fire Chiefs Association on some changes to that particular uh, language, and uh, that is in progress as we speak. So I'm waiting to see what that model language is going to look like. So that's, I think, an important step forward. Um, I think our best long-term strategy, and it's something that I'm currently working on, is trying to create an apprenticeship program where uh, coupling that change in the legislation as well as developing that program, I hope to create a, a direct pipeline with our Evanston youth. Uh, probably a three-year program would be ideal, where they'd get the education and training they need. They'd get the opportunity to learn a great deal about the department. We would learn a great deal about them. I think not only would it help us with our diversity, but really is a more valid way to bring great people on the fire department. Instead of taking a single test and a single interview, imagine a three-year job interview where we really get to learn about that individual and he learns about the great city of Evanston and our department. So those are just a couple things that we're working on, I think, for that long-term strategy. And I'm, I'm very pleased to say that we're making positive strides in both. Well, I just want to thank you then for your commitment. You mentioned that, I think it was a year ago, when you were coming into this position. And I know that uh, Alderman Simmons uh, has made uh, recommendations through our MWEBE committee to help Evanston residents. And again, thank you for your commitment to diversity. Thank you very much, and it will continue. Um, let's see here. The next piece that we're going to do in terms of enhancing our software platform is going to be our emergency patient care reporting. 
and I don't want to get into the weeds here with this, but I think the great advantage to this is just going to be better data management. It's a big priority for me to make sure that we're managing data better to capture, you know, how, how well are we doing things within the city. And so EMS is a big part of what we do. I mentioned it was 64 percent of our call volume. So we want to get better software that's more easier to use in the field, but more importantly, can we leverage that data to measure effectiveness, especially when it comes to community risk reduction. Um, our community engagement programs are going to continue, including uh, bringing back the Citizens Fire Academy for 2018, so we're very excited about that. And of course, we're still in the process of, process of fully implementing our strategic plan and with uh, a goal towards completion in 2020. So thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity and time to talk with you this evening about the annual report, and I'll be happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Mr. City Manager. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Police Chief Richard Eddington to uh, step forward. Uh, Alderman Wilson asked that we uh, come with an update on our stop and frisk uh, policy. And so uh, uh, Chief Eddington and Commander Glue are here. Chief, good evening. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, Mr. City Clerk, Alderman, and City Manager, appreciate the opportunity to come and discuss this uh, topic uh, with you this evening. I want to add to this that one of my primary functions this evening is to add context of how we do stop and frisk in the city of Evanston. And in order to do that, I have sent you several preparatory uh, piece of information, mostly our training bulletins. And if you take a minute to look at the training bulletin 6-11, it talks about the reasonable standard suspicion, which is established by the Supreme Court in Terry versus Ohio in 1968. There have been multiple court cases since that time that have expanded on this doctrine. And as you walk through that training bulletin, it, it highlights those for you. Uh, also, on uh, January 1st, uh, 2016, Public Act 099-0325 became effective. There were several requirements for all Illinois police agencies engaging in stop and frisk that became a law at that point in time, and we have complied with that law since its inception. One of the significant parts of that issue uh, of that uh, legislation is a uh, stop receipt where once we're done with a uh, stop, we're mandated to provide a receipt for you uh, on of that stop. Uh, one of the reasons, in my opinion, that this particular topic has garnered such attention uh, recently uh, nationwide is a, a series of court cases uh, out of New York that regarded uh, stop, uh, that dealt with stop and frisk. Um, there are several significant issues about that case that are germane to this discussion. One that case was not fully vetted with the change of uh, uh, with the change of uh, mayoral administrations in uh, the city of New York. That uh, case wasn't fully uh, vetted or appealed. Uh, I think that's significant. Also, in my opinion, where the city of New York kind of went off the rails with that was as soon as. Uh, stop and frisk becomes a metric for police activity. It becomes difficult to control. And, and once you step away from the constitutional requirement and make it a measurement of police activity, you, you jumble up the rules. And I think that was a significant uh, misappropriation of const, uh, ComStat uh, techniques and strategies that caused uh, that uh, suit to be brought. A significant difference in uh, the Evanston Police Department's use of stop and frisk is that uh, the Evanston Police Department ascribes to an intelligence-led policing. In short, police officers depend on intelligence gained from a variety of sources to better perform in their jobs. Since 2013, EPD has had an intelligence unit comprised of a crime analyst and intelligence officer who gather, collate, and disseminate intelligence. Through the intelligence process, information is gained from a variety of sources, including incident report, interviews with victims and suspects, community members, social media, text to tips, and information shared by outside law enforcement agencies. Intelligence is uh, verified by the intelligence unit through independent sources, and then is disseminated throughout the department via the weekly uh, deployment meeting. Equipped with this information, members of the Evanston Police Department are able uh, 
are able to devote uh, resources and manpowers to specific uh, public safety concerns. The use of this vetted intelligence is, is significant in our maintaining the integrity of this system uh, because it is a huge difference if we say go out and look for these individuals that have guns versus go out and look for some guns. It, it, it's a totally different concept of who we're focused on and why we're focused on them. I think that um, one of uh, as as we begin this discussion, I, I realize that uh, we always want to overlay any police data on, on the demographics of the jurisdiction. Um, I, I we will get there will be several slides to get to the point of this, but uh, human behavior does not mirror the demographics of a community, and we police behavior not demographics. Um, Commander, can we go uh, to the first slide, please? Uh, I, I think uh, as, as we work through these slides, uh, the, the breakdown uh, uh, and division of uh, whom uh, are the victims and, uh, is, is significant. Um, in, in this slide, uh, once again, as, as we deal with an African-American population of approximately 18 percent, we see how that African-Americans are overrepresented as crime victims um, uh, by almost double their, the population. Uh, on the next slide, suspects, uh, we're dealing with the same situation and over-representation um, of uh, African-Americans uh, African as suspects. And, and once again, the point of these charts is these are what is driving the stop and frisk, the data we collect. We are focused on uh, crime-related events. Uh, next slide deals with adult suspects, which uh, and, and the slide after that, juvenile suspects. Uh, we deal with the arrests on the next slide, 2017 arrests, uh, juvenile arrests on the next slide. Uh, we deal with adult contact cards, um, juvenile contact cards on the next slide, and, and finally is a chart that summarizes all, all those events. I would like to point out that all those uh, events were, were pretty closely tracking um, the, those breakdowns of, of suspects and offenders in whom is being stopped and frisked. If we go to the slide, all contact cards and pat downs, one of the significant issues I want to draw to your attention is the body of case law that deals with stop and frisk. There's a body of case law that deals with stops. There's a body of case law that deals with frisks. If you look at the number of stops we've completed and you look at the number of frisks, it's about uh, half of those stops result in a pat down. There are specific uh, rules articulated in the case law when it is appropriate for a pat down. Not all stops result in pat downs. We, as a matter of fact, uh, an individual who was stopped the most times uh, by the department um, is a homeless individual. We found no need to pat him down in the 10 times that we were stopped to because he was uh, called in as a suspicious subject. We knew who he was uh, from our prior contacts in the allegations did not rise to the need to lay hands on him. And so each of these stops is an independent decision of whether or not a, uh, uh, a pat down ensues. One of the things that I'd also like to mention is that there have been no uh, uh, complaints regarding uh, stop and frisks in 2017 uh, lodged uh, against the police department. I realize it's a significant amount of data, it's a significant amount of body of legal work that backs up this data, and I and Commander Glue are prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Alderman Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, the, the main reason I wanted to have this on the agenda is because I think this, you know, how we're policing the community and these policy issues I think should always be uh, on our minds, so I don't think we want to be reactive. I think to the extent possible, we want to be as proactive as possible. Um, before some of the council members were here, there were a number of um, you know proposals come before the council. I think a, a few of those things we've you know collectively rejected in the past. Things like safe zones, things that are um, you know basically uh, uh, enabling the police to forego the um, ordinary process and procedures, and we, we, we've rejected those in the past. So, um, and I don't see any reason to, you know, reconsider those. I think it's important 
uh, to preserve individual and civil rights and I, you know, ensure that the staff and, and your forces uh, is doing that. So can you just tell me a little bit more about the, the ongoing training that the officers um, participate in in keeping up to speed on the development of the laws and, and the, you know, Terry's an old case, but uh, as things evolve and, and develop, tell me, tell me what, the tr what the training looks like. I don't think it's that old of a case, but uh, that's oh. my, my perspective. Uh, there, the department has invested in uh, multiple training venues uh, o over the course of, of 2018. Uh, the first one is the Police Law Institute, where officers are required to take a monthly legal update test on specific is issues, including stop and frisk. Um, th that is an ongoing effort that will continue uh, for uh, the next two years and will reevaluate uh, the need for that. Also, in the public act I mentioned, there are certain mandated training uh, requirements that need to be covered annually and biannually by all police departments in Illinois. The Police Law Training Institute uh, testing covers those, and, and it is electronically documented, which saves us some time. Uh, Sergeant Gil Levy did a lot of research in finding uh, that uh, firm to provide that training. Also, an advantage to uh, staffing and in, indirectly the Evanston taxpayer is because the officers are taking those tests while they're on duty. Usually the first portion of their long day, they're not out of the city getting trained. They're getting trained here uh, in town and available for emergencies if we need them. Additionally, in uh, 20, uh, late 2017, we stood up the uh, Lexapol program, which is a rewrite of our policies. In addition to that, the Lexapol program has a daily training module that the officers take right after roll call or sometime during the course of their shift, which touches not only on stop and frisk, but other uh, legal issues and policy issues that the officers must maintain a proficiency on. And so I would say in this last period of time, uh, uh, frankly, as, as an effort to uh, curtail police overtime, we have delved into ways to deliver that training uh, in-house with the officers on premise instead of removing them for training. So this is a, uh, we're trying to kill two birds with one stone. Uh, make the training as relevant and as timely as possible, and at the same time uh, save overtime dollars with the training being conducted usually by computer and in here on site. All right, thanks. And I, I, another point um, which has come into more focus after you and I originally had these conversations, but that's what um, there's been some concern on how the uh, police response looks in certain situa situations. Um, there was recently um, an incident where there were two calls about an armed robber downtown in Evanston, then of course even more dramatically uh, this this swatting incident. incident. Um, you and I have discussed this, but I don't know that the public is totally cognizant of the, uh, the idea that um, our, our force is not ordinarily deployed with, um, you know, we don't have a battering ram and, and, and things of that nature from the government, but we also don't uh, deploy um, what people traditionally refer to as machine guns. The, the, the rifles look scary and threatening, but can you just kind of walk us through uh, just briefly, you know, that, that response when the officers are going to be, you know, coming into the street carrying a rifle and why that's the case. You, you explained some of that to me, but maybe just so others have a better understanding. I know that Alderman Fleming is, has fielded some questions about that as well. Y yes, and uh, Alderman Fleming and I have, have discussed this uh, also in, in, um, in, in this particular topic. Um, the, 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 let me address at the outside, outset that the Evanston Police Department uh, does not deploy any uh, fully automatic weapons. This is a, a significant issue for us. It's a significant issue for uh, local police departments nationally. It's just not uh, it's it's not a device, a weapon that we feel is appropriate for domestic law enforcement. Um, the 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 concept of multiple bullets discharging every time you pull the trigger is is not 
uh, in our policy, not in our doctrine. We are much more focused on uh, we are issued and men and allow officers to purchase their own uh, AR-15 rifles, which are semi-automatic, which translates into you pull the trigger once, a round goes off. You pull the trigger again, a round goes off. Versus an automatic, t 20 to 30 rounds go off depending on what's in the magazine. So that need for precise gunfire when gunfire is required is, is our goal. Uh, and I think if we reflect on uh, the swatting uh, incident, which is the most recent, um, the call, the information we were reacting to, and, and once again, this is a, a rather sophisticated hoax in, in a number of ways. Uh, the caller knew the relationship between the names he was using, uh, knew uh, that they were, that one of them was associated with NU, and so they were able to tell a good story over the phone. Part of that story was that uh, one of the individuals uh, had been gravely wounded uh, by being shot by a rifle. That escalates our response to this matter. The, the standoff distances to engage a rifle are much more significant than a pistol, and the accuracy of rifle fire both ways is, is a significant issue when we're dealing with those swatting events. And so at that type of event, you are going to see the shields, you are going to see the, auto, you are going to see the AR-15 rifles. Uh, and, and once again, I have to add, in the context of American policing, we're not an outlier. I mean, if, if you look at the next time any jurisdiction has a similar event, you're going to see officers in other American cities carrying pretty much the same armament that we are. They're carrying semi-automatic pistols, tasers, and AR-15 type rifles. We're, this is not some bizarre thing that only we do. And so I, uh, one of the things that I want to convey to the public and members on the die is, is this is pretty much a standard American law enforcement procedure at this point in time. This, this is, and I, I can't say enough, that this is not an outlier or something that's unique to us. And, and I, to, to verify that, please look at the news footage of, of the next major event in any American city. You will not see officers attired too much differently than those in the city of Evanston. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I have um, Alderman Fleming and then Alderman Braithwaite. Thanks. Um, to go back to that um, weapons question, what, because this is what was asked of me, what weapons do we provide to our officers? So when you get on the force, what do we give you? Do we give the AK? No, no, no AKs. No AKs. We, we're all American. No, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. I don't it, know if you know what it is. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a Soviet era semi-automatic uh, semi rifle. So no, no AKs. What we issue officers when they join the force is a Glock 9mm pistol. That's the only thing we give them. After they off probation, they have the opportunity to purchase off of a list of approved rifles. They can purchase with their own funds an AR-15 rifle that meets certain specifications so it fits in our rifle racks. Uh, we require a light, a sling, uh, and uh, optics are optional. So, but, but when they purchase those, they purchase those with their money according to our specification. But the only firearm that is provided to them with city funds is their service pistol, which at this point in time is a Glock 9 millimeter. All right, thank you. I have a couple questions about the Terry Law. Um, so it talks about investigative stop and pedestrian stop. Am I just assume pedestrian stop is if you're walking down the street and investigative stop is anywhere else you might be? In a car or whatever? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. I was confused by those. Um, and then how long do we keep the contact cards in? You mentioned, and this it mentioned something about our record retention schedule, which I didn't see. So how long are contact cards a year. kept? A year. Okay. A year. And, and once again, we are part of the uh, CPD iClear system, and that is part of the agreement they made with the American, the ACLU on retention of contact cards. So as we are a participant in that system, we're going along with, with what uh, CPD has agreed to with the ACLU. Okay. Um, and then, so it talks about the pat down of the outer clothing or something. Um, do, are we able to search people's belongings if we stop them? 
Yes, I, I think there's some follow-on case law in that bulletin that speaks to uh, containers that are within uh, the passenger compartment or lunge distance uh, when the person is stopped, and that would also apply to if you're walking along with a backpack. If we have the reasonable suspicion to search, we can check those items also. All right. Sorry, guys, I have a couple questions. Um, can you put a person in a car when they're when they're – when you're questioning them, because I know it, the handcuffs are dependent on if you feel safe or so on and so forth. But can you put them in a car, or is that considered like a real detainment? Uh, we have the option. Depending, it's all individually facts based. But I can see several reasons to put a person in a car, uh, all the way from inclement weather to we're still concerned, even though they're handcuffed, they're going to run away. So yeah, I I don't know that the placing in the car would be a decision based on that stop and, and why. So do we have the latitude to do that without escalating it to a formal arrest? Yes, we do. Okay. And then it mentions, um, I have it last page 32. I don't know what it's called. I'm sorry. But um, a previous criminal record as a reason to question someone. And then I ha I, what happens if, because I know people don't have to give all the information for the contact cards, but what happens if you're asking someone questions and they don't want to answer it it would depend alderman and once again depending on how much uh how much information we have are we teetering on the high end of reasonable suspicion so we're almost up to probable cause for arrest i'm going to imagine we're going to be much more demanding if, if we don't have anything under illinois law if we don't have anything if we have no reason to detain further the individual can walk away all right and do these same laws pertain to juveniles yes they do okay so they can be Padded and handcuffed and all that without a parent Absolutely. present. Okay. Um, and then just my last question is on the card that we leave behind or you you leave behind when you when you can when you stop someone and question them, you leave them that card. What is that called? You know, you give it to the citizen and it's the, the stop receipt. Yes, all the stop the stop receipt. Um, so I I see that it has all this information on here. Is it possible because this is what people have told me um, in these stop and frisk situations, right, is that I know you have your reasonable, not doubt, but what do you call it? Reasonable suspicion. Yes. And a lot of times that people don't think that there's a reasonable suspicion. Um, and so that, that there seems to be, you know, that tension there, obviously. And then you get into whether or not the person feels like they were treated harshly or, you know, what, whatever is going on in that stop. Um, and I know you mentioned that you don't have any complaints for this, and I know you don't because I look at the complaints, and I appreciate that you have this complaint option on here, but I guess I'm just trying to figure out, and this maybe can't do this tonight, obviously, but how we get from that point, because there seems to be, when the citizens talk to me, more complaint, and even if I say, did you file a complaint, they don't for whatever reason, they feel like the stop was unjust, and they were treated badly and all those kind of things. And I imagine it's a very tense situation on each part. Um, but it seems like when people I talk to in the community, that's where the tension is. People don't necessarily feel like we have horrible police officers. It's these very delicate interactions that they're having that maybe don't lead to an arrest, but they feel like we're unjust. But they also then, you know, there's no arrest or, you know, like they're maybe too frustrated. They don't make the complaint or what have you. Um, so I guess as I'm just talking, if that's something we can be always mindful of, right? It's I know you have a sensitive job and if someone is stopped and not arrested and so on and so forth, they leave with a little more tension against our police department. So that's where the the rub seems to be, which I'm thankful that's all we have. We're not Chicago where we have all these people in jail who didn't do it and all that. But that little small attention goes a long way in a small community. All the, all the men it does, and I, and I, th I think we are uh, cognizant of that and have attempted to address that issue uh, over time. Uh, not only the de-escalation, but the disengagement training of, of how you explain to an individual where this is what I did and this is why I did it. And, and once again, sometimes that's insufficient, but I think a lot of times it does diffuse the situation to the point where the citizen has at least some understanding that this wasn't just some random act where we decided to pick on you. 
there that we were we can articulate why we did it and I think with that training it has diffused a number of these situations so there's not complaints now is it perfect no do we have to be mindful of it yes but I think as we work towards that goal we're, we're, we're getting more adept at that as time goes by now one more quick question is is the information you provided I know it's this first time I've seen the contact and the pat down information, but the previous screen that has the contact um, card, yeah, that one. So that's not in the annual report. Is is can we get that on our open data portal, Mr. City Manager, or somewhere? Because I usually just FOIA it, but I think it would be good to have just the numbers out there for people who are interested to see what's happening with our police department. Yes, and I, I think the uh, city manager has worked very hard at uh, getting the police dashboard up and running. That's still uh, is struggling to a degree, but this information will be a part of that, and there will be a link from uh, the dashboard to a more comprehensive data set like this one. Okay, Alderman Braithwaite. Uh, thank you, Alderman Wynn. Uh, thank you, Chief. I just have a couple of questions and a couple of points. First point that I think is important that. You mentioned that the number of complaints are down in 2017. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's that's important. And I the reason that I say that is because if we don't hear about the complaints, then we can't respond to it. So despite the national perception of black communities being over-policed, and the numbers here do support it in your first couple of pie charts, but it's difficult for me in looking at this summary, and I remember the, the first time that we saw this data, it was like a landslide. But I'm curious to know when you define victims, maybe in an email to me, just to understand what you mean by victims. I, you know, I, I can go a million different places, so to understand what that category means would be helpful. And then also when I look at these percentages, they're higher to me, particularly within the black community, and it would be nice to have a reference point of as it relates to the demographics of town. Does that make sense? So you said that blacks are overly represented. For example, 50% of the victims, 61% in the juvenile category. But when I look at it, it doesn't give me a relationship to the population in town. And we don't have to get into it now. I mean, I have a few more points so, to make unless you want to respond. No, we, 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 uh, I, I think, uh, let me say, the, the, the base number that I'm using for the African-American population in the city of Evanston is 18%. Okay. And so that, that's that, that's what I'm I'm using as the bar to say we're over or we're under. Okay. And, and, and I will be happy to provide those uh, demographic statistics from the census in, in conjunction with this report. Perfect, perfect. And then the other issue that I or the question that I have is a follow-up again making the point to the community that we have at least I'll say that I have not I think maybe in 2017 one maybe one complaint of someone in terms of the stop and frisk experience but again if I'm not hearing it I don't have any way of truly asking you know you for follow-up and questions but the point I want to make is that so we now have the use of the video cameras all the officers are are uh, wearing the body cameras. How long are you keeping body camera stops on file? Uh, th that's an excellent question, and uh, I, I, let me take a couple minutes to, to talk about it. Um, the Illinois law uh, is excruciatingly complicated. Uh, if 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 there's a an event that I have my body camera on and we're chatting on the street. If if nothing happens from that, ninety days it's gone. Okay. Okay. If there are other events that cause the event to be flagged, now I too am appalled that the Illinois legislature decided to make that a legal term, but it is. So if it's flagged, for instance, if you complain about my conduct, there there's a process that it goes through OPS. Now every body-worn camera event that I record from the time you file that complaint till it's adjudicated, we're responsible for holding on to. We, we, need, we need to maintain that. And so, frankly, uh, I'm sure the members of the dais have seen uh, OPS complaints that have drug on almost a year based on uh, the witnesses didn't come forward. There's a whole lot. So we can, we can hold those forever. 
there are certain other flagged events, arrests, use of force that were mandated to retain for a minimum of two years, some of them forever. But the average, hey, we ran into each other, the policeman talked to me for a minute, 90 days it's gone. 90 days is a good working number. That's great. Thank you. Uh, and I guess the last point I just, and, and this is just more of an update to, to the city council, myself, Alderman Wilson, Alderman Well, Ravel and Alderman Fleming, we all sit on the Alternatives to Arrest Committee uh, that's comprised of staff, uh, members of the police department, and also members of the community. Uh, as a follow-up to the first round of, of information that we saw, you know, the concern was if, if this is the outcome of the number of stops, how many of these stops are actually turning into arrests, how many arrests are turning into convictions, and so on and so forth. So just a brief update, and I think we're going to be coming back with more, I know Alderman Wilson was very strong about the expungement policy, and I think uh, the committee, the subcommittee has met, and hopefully within the next couple of months it'll be coming to Human Services and to Council to have a very nice comprehensive policy. And in addition to that, Chief Eddington has provided out of the, the stops a very focused number of uh, ordinances where cases can actually be diverted from going down to the court system uh, to our administrative adjudication. And then the other update that I think it's important to share that a subgroup of our committee met with the Evanston Police Department just to review their record taking process. And these are folks that worked very closely on the uh, whole ordinance and they were very, very complimentary of our police department and how they are storing records and dealing with juvenile files, et cetera. So I'm looking forward to the next couple of months to be able to report on that. It is a very long process, very detailed. We have a group of lawyers really looking forward, excuse me, really looking into this in detail and it's being led by the Moran Center and we also have someone on staff at Northwestern, but I just thought that this would be the appropriate time to give that update. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, Your Honor, if I could indulge you for one more thing. Sure. sure. Go Ramblers. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Jayhawks. All right. Okay. Uh, next is uh, item SP4. I'm pausing to see if I wish to continue that, but I will not. Um, there's, SP4, several, there's several of us up here who could comment on that. But. I, I did notice the color you were wearing tonight, yes. Madam Mayor. No, oh, this is the wrong color. Is it the wrong color? Yes. It looks awfully close. No, this is Carolina blue. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Next, um, Madam Mayor, members of the council, we had a requested report on uh, public benefit and impact fees. Um, I know that Alderman Fisk had asked that the, this item be continued. Alderman, do you wish any kind of overview, or would you just prefer to? I think to this? Alderman Wynn is going to speak to this. Okay. Well, uh, I, yes, I did want to speak to this. Uh, I think I believe this is in uh, response to my reference to uh, the Community Development Department to develop a uh, a list of public benefits that we could all um, that could be um, put into our city code that. Uh, so that every developer who came to the city and any citizen could understand what a public benefit could possibly be that would be implemented with the planned unit development project. Uh, so I, I would like to have this go to uh, planning and development where as a committee we can discuss this because we're the planning and development committee is the committee that's had the most experience with these planned developments and I think that um, we probably want to discuss this in much greater length than uh, just this evening. And uh, in particular, I would like to have this come back when um, Ms. Leonard is, has returned from her maternity leave, which I understand is in May, because she has a particular expertise on this and uh, was involved in the early on conversations about this uh, in November when I first raised this with her. So I, I would uh, propose that we refer this to PND and for uh, sometime in mid-May when I believe Ms. Leonard will be back. I would second that. Okay. Alderman Rainey? Yes, and I, I agree with that, but also I think that the council and members of planning and development also ought to have some ideas oh, yes. about what public benefits should be because our staff 
is almost always the only ones who have any input, and we need to do that also. I completely agree, so, Alderman Rainey. And there's a lot of information out there um, that's available uh, to research. I've done some of that myself, and I think it's really worth uh, a long conversation and discussion. I agree. Um, so let's do that. Yeah. All right. All right. So. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Do we need to vote on yeah. that? All right. So. To refer, to refer back to planning and development. We can do that in a voice vote, correct? Mm -hmm. All right. So all those in favor uh, referring SP4 back to planning and development for uh, sometime in mid-May, please say aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? Okay. All right. Now we're moving on to SP5. Yes, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, we have before you the 2017 Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report for the City's Community Development Block Grant, Home Investment Partnerships, and Staff Emergency Solutions Grant Program. Um, this was before you. There were some changes that uh, needed to be made, and so we have resubmitted for your approval. Sarah Flax, the Housing Manager, is here to answer any questions. Move approval. All the, any, any lights? All those in favor? Um, yeah, I'm just going to say, I uh, think. Yeah, but I, I do want to just thank uh, uh, Sarah Flax for, uh, as always, yes. uh, outstanding work on this. Um, yes. Sure, and the committee as well. Yeah, I mean, we did a little work on this also. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, there, I see no lights. So all those in favor, please, of um, accepting this uh, plan, the CAPER review. Caper plan, please uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Okay, we're going to move on to SP6 then. Yes, uh, Madam Mayor, Pro Tem, members of the Council, uh, we're here this evening a little early, and that is to uh, begin discussions uh, with you about the uh, fiscal year budget for the fiscal year beginning on uh, January 1st, 2019. Um, I have been doing this for 27 or 28 years. I do not recall ever having a budget discussion with the city council prior to summer uh, before uh, uh, for tonight. And we have a, a presentation that Ashley King, our chief financial officer, and Kate Lewis Lakin, our senior manager and analyst, will make. But I want to give some context and some reasons why we're here. Uh, I think the budget that you have for uh, 2018 is a solid budget. It is a budget that I think reflects the needs of the community. It reflects reasonable uh, expectations for revenues. But um, I think there are larger issues at, at play here. I think that the, the city of Evanston uh, is a very fortunate community that we offer a wide range of services uh, really to all residents. We're a full service city, uh, not only a able police and fire department, a library, public works, parks, recreation, community services, health, um, really the gamut of municipal services we provide. And in the context of which we provide them, and that is in Cook County, Illinois, uh, the costs associated associated uh, with these excellent services continue to rise. They rise uh, because of uh, labor costs. They rise because of pension costs. They rise uh, because of, of capital issues that we have. Uh, they also vary sometimes, and they vary uh, with the investments that are made by our community partners, such as Northwestern University. Uh, they vary uh, because of the economy, the changes that uh, the entire country is going through as far as retail sales, which has really been a, a benchmark for all uh, municipalities around the United States, uh, the retail is changing and we are no different in those changes. Uh, but when you look at um, the needs that we have before us, when you look at uh, the fiduciary responsibilities uh, of the organization, of the corporation, to have appropriate reserves, uh, to fund our uh, appropriate sub-funds, to fund infrastructure, uh, we have work to do. You combine that with the desire of the City Council to move forward with the Robert Crown Center, which we have talked about uh, the need for uh, revenue adjustments for that. Uh, when you look at what our neighbor jurisdictions have done, specifically uh, uh, District 65 with their uh, property tax uh, adjustments, uh, the residents of Evanston, I think, largely feel overtaxed. Uh, and I think that any measure looking at this nationally would give them a good argument to feel that way. So as we look Look at the expenditure challenges uh, moving forward as a community to continue to provide the fine benefits that we do for our residents, to continue to pay our employees a reasonable wage, to continue to be able to tackle uh, 
pension benefits to continue to be able to tackle uh, our outstanding debt. It's my suggestion as your city manager that it will be worth some time over the course of the next six months uh, to look at what is important, to look at what are those things uh, that really make this the community uh, special, those things that we are obligated to provide that no one else provides, um, and, and provide that as a, as a lens. Um, in addition, we need to look at equity and empowerment. We need to make sure uh, that how we spend our money, we are spending equitably throughout the entire community and that we are serving all of our residents. A very, very high bar to meet by any standard, by any measure. Uh, this community regularly meets high bars. Uh, you've heard many presentations this evening, and I think really a, a thread among all of them is the high bar that we hold for ourselves in nearly every area in this community. And fiscal responsibility is also one of those areas. And so uh, we would like to make a presentation to you this evening to, that kind of gives an overview of some trends uh, and then talks about a proposal to move forward with a priority-based budgeting process, uh, which we last conducted in 2012, which I think um, was useful at that time and I think will be a tool uh, to help you uh, as we look at, at the budget moving forward. Because it is my hope to come to you uh, in October of this year with, again, another responsible budget, but also with an eye toward the capital investment we need to make, an eye toward uh, our reserves uh, and, and, and the fairness not only to our residents but to our employees that re resources are being stewarded appropriately. So, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, thank you for letting me make a, a little bit of a prologue there. I'd like to introduce Ashley King. As she's stepping forward, I do want to reiterate an announcement that we made last week, and that is that we have hired a new chief financial officer, Hitesh Desai. Uh, Hitesh is known to, I think, many of you uh, for his 12 previous years of service uh, to the city of Evanston. Uh, so Hitesh will be coming back for a third stint on the staff of the city of Evanston. Um, so it always uh, saddens me to hear members of the public talk about about uh, that we are hiring people that perhaps are not qualified for this important job, to have someone of Mr. Desai's uh, not only deep experience um, in municipal finance generally, but deep experience in municipal finance of the city of Evanston is, I think, a, a great coup for us. He has served the last four years as a finance director in Carpentersville, and we'll be welcoming him back on April the 16th. So I wanted to just make that mention, but I also want to thank Ashley. King for her fine stewardship over the last several months and welcome her tonight. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, Clerk, we Clerk Reed and City Manager Bob Kowitz. Again, my name is Ashley King. I'm here as the Budget and Finance Manager and I have with me Kate Lewis Lakin, Senior Management Analyst. As Wally kind of uh, said in our introduction, we're going to be going through where we're at right now and where we see the priority based budgeting process going. So here's our agenda for tonight. We're going to start by looking at the general fund, which Kate will take a look at, some other funds and kind of competing interests, overview of priority-based budgeting, and a calendar of next steps, and hopefully get some good feedback. So to get started, here's Kate with the general fund projections. Thank you. My name is Kate lewis Lakin. I'm the Senior Management Analyst, and I'll be walking you through some of our preliminary projections for the 2019 general fund budget. So this first slide, to get us started, shows some of the major revenue sources to the general fund. Uh, you'll see 15% of our revenue to the general fund comes from state income and sales taxes, which are unfortunately out of the city's control. Uh, after that, we have property taxes at 9%, and then some of these other taxes listed there, sales tax, uh, building and related permits make up uh, you know, a large portion of our general fund budget. These nine sources make up about half of the general fund revenue, 52 percent, uh, and they'll be the focus of some of our lookbacks and projections later on in this presentation. Just to sort of fill in the other side of the coin, the other half of our revenue is made up of a number of other sources. This slide just shows some of the categories that they fall in. Um, a couple of pieces to note, 15 percent of our revenue is also coming from pension property taxes. Uh, these are a sort of a in and out of the general fund, they're counted as revenue and then immediately counted as an expense to transfer into the pension fund. And then we also have 6.7 percent of our revenues coming from interfund transfers. So these are from um, some of our enterprise funds, parking, water, sewer, et cetera, throughout the rest of the city's budget. 
So this is a chart showing 10-year trends on a couple of those major revenue sources. Uh, so a couple of pieces to note. Sales taxes, after recovering from the Great Recession, have been relatively flat over the past few years. We're not seeing a huge increase in that revenue source. Uh, property taxes took a pretty steep decline uh, in 2011, 2012, around the recession. And we have not returned to the level of property taxes we were relying on before that hit. The Green Line income taxes also has recovered from the recession, but has actually been going down since 2015. And then building permits, the light blue line, that one's fluctuated a lot over the past few years. And you can see 2017, 2018, this was the source of, of our revenue going down quite a bit over the last couple of years, as we've come down a bit from a 2016 high. Alderman Fisk, did you have a question about that? Yes, I'm just curious, why, um, why are property taxes fluctuating so widely? I believe that was due to the decrease in property values. Uh, our assessed value went down quite a bit over the past few years. Um, and as a result of that trend, uh, I think Ashley can look up some specific numbers while we're, while we're going through this. Okay. Like. So this next slide starts looking at some of the expenses we have in the general fund. Uh, our primary source of expenses, expense increases in the general fund is always going to be personnel costs. Uh, it's about 50% 50, 50 about half of the expenses in the general fund are related to personnel. Um, and then a 70 to 80 percent of all of the city's personnel costs do sit in the general fund. So this graph shows personnel costs across all of the funds uh, have gone up by 13.8 percent over the past six years from 2012 through our 2018 budget. In the general fund, that increase has been 11 percent. So again, just a steady increase in those costs over the past few years. Looking at all expenses together. <laughs> Looking at all expenses together, uh, we see a 36% increase to our general fund expenses from 2012 to 2018. Uh, this, there was a steep increase from 2014 to 2015 as a result of the inclusion of the pension property taxes as an expense in that year. Uh, but still taking that out, we do see a steady increase in all of those other years. Talking again about personnel, we thought this was sort of an interesting chart to put, put up. Uh, one of the sources of our personal cost increase is, of course, our cost of living adjustment that employees tend to receive on an annual basis. Um, the blue line shows the city of Evanston's COLA, the cost of living adjustment, over the past 10 years, as compared to the red line, which is showing the percentage increase to the consumer price index in the Chicago area. So again, that's the at sort of estimated actual cost of living in the Chicago area. You'll see that our cost of living adjustment given to all employees uh, has been on average a little bit higher than, than the average CPI increase. Looking at expenses and revenues together, again, personnel costs being the major driver of expenses in the general fund, these major revenue sources being the major drivers in uh, the general fund for the revenue. Personnel costs are continuing to increase at a relatively steady rate, whereas these major revenue sources that we track have been going up and down a little bit. Uh, in 2018, we're actually a little bit lower than we've been uh, in 2017, 2016, uh, and even a couple years before that. So where does this get us to? Uh, we started doing some initial projections on the 2019 budget based on these trends we were seeing in the past few years. Uh, starting with the 2018 budget, we looked at expenses were $114.2 million, revenue $114.8, and we budgeted a surplus of $600,000. <coughs> Taking that out to 2019, we're expecting a cost of living increase that goes up to about $1.5 million, health insurance expense increase of about $269,000, uh, and non-personnel expenses, 661. Again, we got those increases by looking the past five to 10 years on those expenses and what the trends have been. That brings our projected expenses for 2019 to $116.7 million. On the revenue side, uh, we're comfortable projecting a 1% decrease overall in revenue. Uh, that's, again, based on what we're seeing on those major revenue sources uh, and, uh, extrapolating that out to the rest of the budget. 
uh, and we're seeing re revenues at about $113.7 million. Putting those two together, we expect uh, going into the 2019 budget with about a $3 million deficit to correct. Alderman Fleming, did you have a question? No, it was a few slides back. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't that's see okay. you. Like, that, that's okay. I'm going to get a bell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm new at this over here. No, no, I know everyone's looking at the screen. So I think it's page seven where you had that red and blue graph for personnel costs. I just was interested, and you might know the before that. Yeah. Yep. Um, I was just interested. Is that projection just going along with, like you said, the cola and the raises, or are these like? So these I guess I want to see if it was just cola and 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 such, or is this like also? that we're, we were bringing on more new staff. So this was all personnel costs, so this would include new staff. Um, these were actual costs from 2012 to 17, and then 18 was the budget expense, so this does include all salaries, all health insurance, and all other benefits. But would you say that most of that increase is become because of salary and, and COLA and health versus that we brought on a lot of new staff? Yes, okay. I would say that. Thank you. I also have Alderman Braithwaite. Uh, thank you. I'll, do you mind just going back one more mm -hmm. slide? And I know that Ashley's looking for the numbers. I, I'm still just having a difficult time digesting mm -hmm. this, the property tax line. I mean, I don't know too many residents who right. property taxes has dropped. So that at, is at actually, the, sorry to, to clarify this, that is actually the general fund property tax number. So in 2012, we broke out the library property tax. So that is uh, a big portion of why that was such a decrease, because we started listing them separately on the property tax bill. Okay. okay. If that makes sense. But then it, uh, going forward, when we incorporated the township into the general fund, that is included in here. Okay. Any other points of clarification? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and just to close out the general fund discussion, uh, our general fund reserve policy is 16.6% of operating expenses. Uh, our unaudited numbers show us closing out 2017 at an ending fund balance of 12.8%. Uh, and our budget will put us at the end of 2018 at 13.4%. So staff does recommend that we continue to adopt surplus budgets in order to help this fund balance going forward uh, and prevent it from getting any lower in the future. So with that, I will bring Ashley back up to discuss other funds uh, and our upcoming process. Okay, we spend a lot of time talking about the general fund. However, we have a number of competing interests, as Wally alluded to in the introduction, as well as 37 other funds to worry about within the city. First, capital. Capital obviously is a big demand on the city of Evanston. This is the capital improvements plan as presented in the 2018 adopted budget. Um, it is a five-year plan for $353 million. And as we know, there are a couple of big projects included in here. The Robert Crown Community Center at $48.5 million, as we talked about in February. Again, that's about $1.5 million a year in debt service payments, um, which would have to be through a tax levy increase or expense reductions, as well as the discussed main library renovations, which have been pushed out but are still a capital need for the city, at $10.5 million. That number, as Director Danza Klein said, would increase if we, if we push that further out. It should be noted that the debt limit would have to increase. We're currently at $112.67 million out of our $113 million. That's our internal limit. Uh, we would propose increasing that to $150 <laughs> million in order to fund these big projects. So as you know, we have a number of unmet capital needs. And this is just talking about the general obligation bond funded capital. So this is facilities and parks and streets, it has nothing to do with kind of the capital that is water or sewer or TIF related. Those are kind of in a, in a separate bucket. But in working with the city engineer, Lara Biggs, we took a look at what the geo bonds uh, should be funding. And it was about $21.8 million a year. Currently, we are funding $9 million of that. So about 41%, less than half. Over the course of four years, this is $51.2 million in unmet capital needs. 
just to touch on some other funds that we have here in the city of Evanston. The water fund is looking to receive increased revenue from new water sales expected in November of this year. Additionally, the Solid Waste Fund is going to have a property tax levy uh, that is on the tax bill for the first time, reducing the deficit for that fund. It should be noted that CDBG and other federal funds have been um, received inconsistent, inconsistently in 2017, and there's some uncertainty with the administration and those funds moving forward. Two more funds. The insurance fund, again, still in the negative. However, we have budgeted for 2018 a surplus throughout the year. So we're hoping to um, kind of be closer to zero as the year ends for that one. And then the good news on this slide is the Washington National TIF. As you all know, this TIF expires at the end of 2018, so we're going to be able to bring it back onto the tax rolls. And without a property tax increase, this means that we'll receive $1 million in additional revenue uh, approximately to the city of Evanston. That's just the city's portion. Annually. Annually. Yeah. Annually. Yes, correct. Also, let's not forget about the pension funds. I know it's uh, been the city council goal to have pensions funded around 50%. We are not quite there. These numbers are from 1117. It should be noted that investment income in 2017 was higher than expected, so we're working on a, a, an actuarial report. We hope to have that out in the next couple of months, but we're still only funded for the firefighters at 43% and for police at just under 47%. So all competing interests for the city of Evanston and difficult decisions to make. In summary, again, the general fund, as Kate mentioned, we're looking at about a $3 million shortfall, given those assumptions. Obviously, it's, it's very early in 2018. Um, the city also faces a number of new construction projects that we'd like to embark on, capital projects, and we look to, to better fund pensions. That brings us here today, asking you to embark upon a priority-based budgeting process for 2019 that would ensure that the projects that we are proposing funding match the city's priorities. So what is priority-based budgeting? As Willie mentioned, 2012 was the last time Evanston engaged in this process, and the goal is really to prioritize the city's services and fund them accordingly with the proposed 2019 budget. So we're going to look at the entire organization, uh, identify every program that we offer, evaluate those programs' relevance to a number of stated goals that I will expand upon in the next couple of slides, and allow us to kind of realign and reprioritize. So here's the, the outline of the, the five steps in the proposed process. Number one, identify these programs. We already started working with directors to kind of drill down into what specifically they offer within their individual departments and within their, their business units. Number two, define the metrics with, with which we will measure all of these programs. So the first, there's kind of two parts to the metrics. The first part is looking at kind of the city's role in providing this program, if you will. Are we mandated to provide the program? Is there a cost recovery? What's the return on investment for this individual program? Is, has there been a change in demand? Is it more popular? Are people using it more and more? The reliance on the city to provide the service as opposed to a nonprofit or a private uh, entity. And then the portion of the community that is served by the program. So this is the first step of, of kind of metrics that we'll be measuring these programs by. The second group, is five of the six city council goals. Again, city infrastructure and facilities, community development and job creation, affordable housing, police community relations, and city finances. The sixth goal we're kind of going to take on its own and look at all of this through an equity lens. So what we are hoping to do is just Initially, when we're looking at everything, I think right now we're at about 140 different programs that the city offers, just have one box that says, does this program specifically address issues of equity in the city of Evanston? It will kind of be a, a yes, no check box. Then once we come back with all the metrics, we're looking at applying a more in-depth equity lens to the bottom third of these programs. So we'll look at those individually and more specifically at that time. 
So here's the timeline we have proposed for this. First, we have three kind of groups of internal staff looking at all of these programs and starting to rank them. Uh, beginning tomorrow with departments scoring and rank their, ranking their own programs. Then we're looking at a cross-departmental rank, ranking. And then we're going to look at the budget team coming in and ranking the programs as well, kind of with more of a, a financial lens. We'd like to come back on April 30th and get your input and um, have a workshop in which you can help us score all of these programs. And then go into May asking the public to engage with us as well through a number of outreach opportunities, which we're still kind of working on refining. We would come back at the end of May with a check-in and a final presentation at the end of June. And then this would guide the finance and budget staff on how we would put together the proposed budget, with the proposed budget coming out October 6th uh, of this year. And that is the, the process. I'm open for feedback, discussions, questions. Alderman Fisk. I do too. <laughs> Who's mandating? Um... Well, I think there, th th that's a great question. Are we mandated to provide the service? I think um, in 2012 we had that question, and it included things like police and fire service that are not provided by other jurisdictions that the city of Evanston was responsible for doing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't Water necessarily sewer. have a, I'm sorry? Water sewer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. Kind of basic uh, quality of life programs that are not able to be provided by any other municipality. Um, one, one of the questions that I had for the city manager at some point last year um, when I was wagging my tail over this was um, if we could have a list of programs that were required to have a, the state or federal uh, government, it would be, really be helpful to have just a list of those so that we know those are included. There's nothing we can do about them because during the time when you're having your staff review of mm -hmm. all of this um, and I wish we were involved a little earlier in the process but I understand why you're doing it the way you are it just would be helpful I think to have have a list of those so that we know um, that's our starting point sure um, but yeah no this is um, really helpful I think Alderman Fleming um, yeah, I think this is great. Thank you. Um, very helpful. So I have a question, two questions. One, I know we talked about the library, and I know the library has a plan for itself, but mm -hmm. I guess I'm not sure why it's why it's on here. If we, I know, if we haven't decided, we're moving forward. I guess it's just a, it's just an oh. observation I made. Right? It's listed a couple different times as this. Correct. when I when I read this, it's like we've decided to move forward with the library. Mm -hmm. So that was my observation. And seeing that up there, just one. And, and I apologize. And of course, this entire um, list of capital projects was just listed in the 2018 budget, and it all none of these are, are, of course, sure things without uh, the council's input and vote on it. These are just kind of what staff saw as uh, potentials to bring forward. Right. So. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that as people maybe are looking at this at home. Um, and then I just want to be very complimentary of this process. I think this is. When you grow up poor, this is what you do. We don't call it priority-based budgeting. Anybody who was poor growing up, you just have a limited amount of money. You pick what you're going to pay. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this will be very helpful for us going into next year, and hopefully the community will participate in these early conversations so when we get to October, mm -hmm. you know, people understand where we're coming from and, and they've participated and paid attention so we don't have as much tension looking at a $3 million deficit. Mm -hmm. Other lights? Comment? And if I may, just to kind of wrap up, I think Alderman Fleming's last point is a really good one. You know, this is not a $3 million deficit. This is a $6 million deficit. This is a $10 million deficit. This is, this is a much larger number in order for the council to address the needs that you want to address. Um, it, it, uh, my recommendation to you as your city manager is we can no longer completely debt finance our entire capital program. Um, this building 
will make Robert Crown look like uh, a, a small tool shed uh, to deal with this building. Right. And when I became your city manager nine years ago, there was scaffolding around this building for 10 years. The city rented scaffolding every month around this building for 10 years because the the, 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 the large issue of what to do with this building. And we decided to stay. We put a new roof on the building for a million plus dollars, uh, and we're here. But ultimately, the internal mechanisms of this building are, are slowly but surely failing, and we will have to come up with, to come to grips with where, what to do with this building. Um, and that's just one thing: police, fire, headquarters, the other community centers, all of your streets, uh, the, the people's desires for sidewalks, alleys, all of those things. We do not have the financial wherewithal to, to grapple with. So, yes, I think under normal circumstances, a three million dollar deficit this early in the year is not a big deal with a hundred odd million dollar budget. Um, but it's, that's not the number we're really dealing with. The number we're dealing with is twice, three times, four times. Uh, that amount annually in order, I think, to really put the city of Evanston's general funds, certainly finances, in, in a good place. And we've done tremendous work with economic development. Uh, we've done tremendous work with water. I mean, that was something that the last city council really made a priority. Um, and we've now have contracts with two and hopefully a third community in the not too distant future. Uh, and that's real revenue coming into the city. So, um, and I appreciate the council's uh, openness to this process. We want to be diligent with us uh, because I think uh, the plan that we will ultimately come with in October uh, will be our level best to address these much larger issues and there'll be a lot of people upset. There will be lots of community groups, there will be employee groups, there will be a lot of people unhappy because we are going to propose, I am going to propose as your city manager to stop doing many things. And people will say we can't. People will say we pay, high, we pay our high property taxes and darn it we expect all of these various things. And as you saw, property tax is a relatively small part of what it takes to operate this organization. So um, thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem and the council for your good words. Thank you to Ashley and to uh, to Kate for the, and Morant. Thank you. You also were involved in the, in the planning uh, of all this. And so we have a schedule and we will come back to you as part of that fifth Monday meeting on April 30th. So it'll be uh, the update on the affordable housing work that we're doing as well as uh, an update on this process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, with respect to this item, we need um, a motion to accept and place this on file. So move. Is, it, is there a second? A second. All right. All those in favor of uh, the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. With that, we come to call of the wards. And Alderman Rainey. Um, just thanks to the council for your support for Good to Go. Right. Alderman Fleming? No report. Alderman Fisk? Alderman Braithwaite? Oh, just a quick thank you to uh, members of the council, Alderman Ravel, Alderman Fleming, uh, City Manager Wally Bobkowitz, and there were some members of our city of staff that attended our Chessman Gala this weekend. Appreciated your support. It was a very successful event. and. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Wilson. No report. I will say that uh, I, my next office hours will be April 5th, Thursday, April 5th, uh, from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. at Brothers K Coffee Shop at the corner of Hinman and Main. Alderman Rusiman. Thank you. Um, I want to give a special thank you to Crystal Jefferson. She is a crossing guard here in Evanston that works in the Fifth Ward, and she um, has served our young people exceptionally well, um, particularly in an incident that happened last week. So I want to thank her publicly for um, giving our, our students the attention that they deserve. Alderman Sufferton? No. Alderman Revell. All right. That completes call of the wards. Would someone like to motion, make a motion to adjourn? Are we doing acceptance? Second. No, I don't think okay, we no. But we always have it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. All right. Uh, all those in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. There's a lot to chew on here. Thank you. <laughs>